This is the title of my talk, All My Friends Are Dead, uh, which is really about time, emotion, and form in early Islamic poetry. How does it feel to enter a new era? So we might claim to know when an era has ended and a new one has begun, when we assign it a date. But is that actually how humans experience the passage of time? We can say the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, or that 2022 marked the end of the pandemic, or that we are now living in the digital age. But our historical shifts actually felt this way. Are they really experienced unilaterally, simultaneously, and equally by everyone, as these dates suggest? Or is the feeling more subtle and personal, like this headline suggests, uh, in the feelings that we experience, the intimate moments of change? So I think you'll agree with me that they are. This is why I turn to literature. So by studying Arabic poetry, I want to know how literature shapes the felt experience of epical change. Uh, that is the movement from one generation to the next. The felt, the existential transition of this experience. So for me to answer this question, I turn to the most eventful rupture that changed Arabic poetry and the status of Arabic language forever, Islam. Islam as an event produced its own calendar, literally marking a new framework of time for Muslims everywhere. But it also did something else. It produced a new liminal generation, a generation of poets that I'm translating as liminalites, in Arabic, the Mukhadramun. So these poets witnessed and lived the rupture of Islam firsthand. And through their poetry, they articulated the experience of cataclysmic change and great emotional upheaval. But my argument today is that these world-shattering transformations were not limited to a poem's content. But more significantly, they shaped the foundational building blocks or the structure of what made a poem poetry in the turbulent beginnings of the early Islamic era. Let me introduce you to Amr ibn Madi Karib. He was a liminalite, a poet. Sorry. Uh, a poet, a legendary warrior of mythic proportions. He was really a larger than life character. So imagine like Aragorn from Lord of the Rings or Rustam from the Shahnameh, if you're familiar with that. And he was known for his bravery, honor, and strength on the battlefield. But after his conversion to Islam, he really had a difficult time reconciling his pre-Islamic past with the Islamic present. He had helped the Muslim army achieve victory, military victory. But when it came time to divide the spoils of war, uh, he, was, he nearly came out of this experience empty-handed. Because it had turned out that un, in the new Islamic order, the spoils of war were being divided based on how much a warrior had memorized from the Quran, rather than the feats and the accomplishments on the battlefield. Embarrassingly, Ahmad had only memorized a single verse of poetry, uh, of the single verse of the Quran. So he really left uh, quite feeling disenfranchised and uh, angry. So these types of stories that we can engage with in the biographical literature really help contextualize or even humanize these poets. But today, I'm going to show you how the structural composition of his poetry, of Amr's poetry, becomes inverted to reflect his world being turned upside down. Amr really excelled in one poetic mode, a poem known as the war song, or the Hamasiyah in Arabic. The structure of this poetic mode is really defined by its motifs about honor. So the poem depicts bravery and courage, especially on the battlefield, but in other contexts as well. But it's not just about excessive violence or recklessness or this idea of just bloodthirst. Really, it was about the steadfast defense of one's honor, but by any means. It was quite literally the poetic principle of striking intensity, 
moving and committing deeds with urgency and to the right extent. So this is what a hamasiya looks like in Arabic. It's broken down into episodic segments, and you can see its layout and format. But what I want us to focus on is really the poem's most potent motif. The unsheathing of the warrior's sword. You know you are in the beginning of a hamasiya when the sword is unsheathed. It means that the fighting will not end until the sword returns, and the sword will only return after the battle is won. So this sword sheath dialectic is an example when a motif in poetry and its position in a poem becomes so integral that it fuses with the poem's structure. However, in Amr's poem, that sword never returns to its sheath. Beauty is not the armor you wear, a mantle draping the shoulder. Beauty is the metal you bear, the glory of a soldier. The poem begins with a meditation on the true essence of honor. The poem itself, however, is about how Ahmed rescues his tribe from a raid against the enemy. But in the second section, we see Ahmed preparing for battle. He says, to face the slings of fate, I ready a shield and an agile horse. I sharpen twin edge, his sword, cleaver of helmets and armor in two. But by the end of the poem, there's really a distinct shift in mood. The poem moves from celebratory to elegiac. After the battle is over, Amr takes to burying the fallen. And thus the poem ends with the final verse. All my friends are dead, and like a bare sword, I remain. Metaphorically, a sword to remain bare means that it has lost its second half, the sheath, the part of the sword that symbolizes restraint, a core principle of honor in the Hamasiyah. But when a sword remains unsheathed at the end of the poem, it marks the poem's structural inversion. So in a typical Hamasiya, the sentiment in that final verse should have began the poem. The poet laments the dead, unsheathes his sword, seeks vengeance, and honor is restored, then creating the poetic space to reflect and meditate on honor. But here, the emotional valence is left open-ended, ambiguous and vague. It lacks closure. In a world that is turned upside down for the liminal poet, the poem fails to reach the structural resolution of a typical Hamasiya. War songs typically have clear delineations between enemy and ally, victory and defeat, beginning and end. But when the organizational logic of the poem is disrupted, those boundaries begin to collapse. Enemies he had slain in, in pre-Islamic feuds could now be considered as friends in an emergent Islamic present. So what does the end of an era feel like? In graver circumstances, like we've seen with Amr, it is waking up to the realization that you are the last of a generation, that all your friends are dead, those who were and those who could have been but can't, maybe because you killed them. For Amr, entering a new era could mean trying to reconcile that contradiction in his poetry. For the poem, however, it means contending with a new reality one that pushes poetic modalities to their limits. Thank you.